We welcome you into our presence as you have called us into your presence. We've come, some of us this morning, Lord, bursting with joy, and some of us with great heaviness. Now we pray that you will touch each of us. You will fill us with your spirit. You will shape us so that in the week to come, we may be agents of your kingdom. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, I would like to invite the Kali family to come up. And also those who have come to support them in this baby dedication. Please come and join us on the stage. So Brian and Katrina have been with the Green Lake family for how long now? Almost a year. They joined us from California and they came with Ethan. And I noticed them straight away because Ethan is around the same age as my daughter. In fact, they're about a month apart and they have been growing in friendship. You know, we, we don't necessarily believe in, you know, arranged marriages, but exceptions will be made <laughs> for these two. Um, so before we do this, let me ask you a few questions first of all. Um, and these are for you, Brian. Okay. Yeah. Do you remember how much Ethan weighed when he was born? Oh, no, this is no <laughs> test of how good a father you are. It's just a random question. Oh, uh, this was unscripted. I, do it. Um, I should know. S six, eight pounds, two ounces? <laughs> Mom? Mom's telling me. Yes, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and um, could you possibly walk us through the meaning of Ethan's names? Here's another unscripted question. Ethan, uh, Micah, Kali. Um, Ethan, uh, we, we liked it. I guess Ethan and Micah, of course, are both uh, biblical. Uh, Ethan, we liked it because it was kind of like steadfastness, um, stick to itiveness, and we kind of liked that about the name. Micah, um, we like the sound of the name, but the meaning, um, it's, uh, it escapes me. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> well, it's a privilege and an honor that you have chosen to bring Ethan and to have him dedicated. And we are following in the footsteps of some biblical examples when we do this. In Psalm 127, uh, we are told that children are a heritage and a reward from God. Um, and we have examples of parents bringing children to be blessed by God. In Samuel, Hannah does that with um, her child. In Luke, Mary and Joseph do that with Jesus. And when Jesus is an adult, we see him inviting children to come so that he can lay his hands of blessing on them. And of course, having a child is at once a challenge and a privilege and a reward. Um, and I know when we left the hospital, we were not given a manual on how to raise our child. So all the blessings that are given are needed. At this time, I want to invite everyone to just pull out this dedication of intention that you have in your bulletin. And uh, we will read through that. Brian and Katrina, in gratitude for the gift of Ethan, you present him in Christ. In dependence on God's grace, will you endeavor by example and teaching to provide him with a home of faith and love that he may know throughout his childhood and growth into adulthood the warmth, 
hope, and freedom of the Christian faith, that he may welcome life's beauty, learn from its pain, and share in its joys, that his love for others may deepen with knowledge and insight of every kind, that he may discover what is the breadth and length and height and depth of the love of God, that his life may be open to the grace and purpose of God. And will you, or family and friends gathered here this day, seek to be examples through which Ethan, Micah, Kali can discover the meaning of the Christian faith and stir into flame the gifts of God, the gifts God has given this child, whatever they may be. And will you, as a church, surround the Kali family with your love for the strengthening of their life together to be for these parents and their child a community that shows the love of Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, and here is the dangerous part. I'm going to attempt to take Ethan as we bow our heads for a prayer of dedication. Or in fact, you will hold him. I'll just put my hand on him. All right, let's pray. (laughs) God, thank you so much for blessing the Carly family with this incredible gift of life. Thank you for Ethan. Thank you for all that he is. Lord, we recognize that children are gifts and they are loaned to us for a time. We pray wisdom, we pray love, we pray patience upon Katrina and upon Brian as they steward this life. God, we ask that all your promises, all your wishes, all your hopes, all your dreams for Ethan's life will come to pass. We ask, dear God, that as a community we can be there to help, to babysit, to cook meals, to encourage as they grow Ethan into the stature of a man of God. And Father, we pray that you will fill their home with the Spirit of God, that they may be a light set on a hill, and that people will be drawn to your love through the example of this family. Thank you for the uh, dedication. Thank you for the support of mom, of dad, of grandparents, and of friends and family. And we ask that you will walk with Ethan as he begins this journey that we call life. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our offering today will be for the church budget, and I have the privilege of uh, using the church budget almost on a weekly basis. Um, One of the things I've had the privilege of doing this year is uh, helping with students who are attending the various universities here in Washington, in Seattle. We have students at the University of Washington, at Seattle Pacific University, at Seattle University, um, at the one in Bothell, and they have all been blessed by your generous giving to the church budget by the way of food. They have been fed most weeks on Fridays, sometimes on Saturdays, and they have been welcomed into a caring and a loving community, and all of this was made possible by your generous giving. And so at this time, I encourage you to continue giving so you can help the students, current and future, that will walk through the doors of Green Lake. Would the deacons please stand for prayer? God, we thank you that you give each of us means, you give each of us the strength and the health to work. Some large, some small, but all a gift from you. At this time, we pray that the gifts that will be given will be used to further the love of God, to encourage the downtrodden, to mend the broken, and to give hope to those without any hope. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Good morning, Good morning, beautiful Green Lake children. They are angels. Don't they look like angels? Oh, this is my favorite part of children's story, just getting to see all the children of our church and our guests. So, who goes to school? Who goes to school? Whose school year is already over? A couple? Yeah? Chris? Megan? Okay. Whose school is going to get out in the next week? Or two weeks? Or three weeks? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to do, before I start talking about the end of the school year, we're going to do a little bit of an experiment. Um, we just need to do some observation. That's a type of research. And we're going to do some observational research this morning. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say something and I'm going to ask you to stand up. So get ready to use your muscles a little bit. If you have blonde hair, stand up. Any shade of blonde hair. Good, good. So we have a few blondies. Okay, you can sit down. If you have brown hair, stand up. If you have black hair, stand up. Okay, we got a lot of ups and downs. Okay. If you are in, if you're in first grade this year, stand up. If you're in third grade, any third graders? Yep. If you're not in school yet, stand up. If you might be in preschool, or you might go to daycare, or you might stay home. We have a few of those. We have some babies up here standing on laps. Yeah, okay. If you have brown eyes, stand up or raise your hand. Stand up if you have brown eyes. Good, okay, any blue eyes out there? Browns can sit down, blue eyes. Green eyes or hazel eyes. Okay, so that's good. Okay, if you have a skeleton in your body, stand up. That's what your bones. Your skeleton means your bones on the inside. Everybody should be standing up. If they have a skeleton, they should be able to stand up. Even the babies can do a little jumping. Okay, good, good. Okay, sit down. So, what this tells me for this church, for this group, for my research cohort right here, it tells me that everybody's different, right? Yeah. Aren't we all different? But we all have bones on the inside, right? So in some ways we're all the same, and in other ways we're different. Okay, so let's talk about what we're good at, okay? I just witnessed, we all just witnessed, our children's choir singing. So if you're good at singing, stand up. All right. You can sit down. If you're good at acting, have you ever been in a play? If you're good at acting, are you good at dancing? Anybody here good at dancing? All right. If you're good at running, stand up. Okay. If you're good at climbing, stand up. If you're good at baseball or softball, stand up. These are your recruits. Where's Ken? These are your recruits for next time. Okay. Soccer, good at soccer, okay, good at basketball, <laughs> volleyball, hiking, all right, I want to see you all there this afternoon, okay, bicycling, okay, writing stories, anybody go to writing stories? or telling stories, or making up stories. I bet a, a few of you are good at making up stories. Um, reading, good at reading, good at math, good at math, good at Legos. Okay, now I have boys at home, some of you might not know this thing, but I'm gonna say it. Good at Minecraft, obsessed with Minecraft. <laughs> Okay, okay, have a seat. You're good at Minecraft? Good. Anybody here good at sewing? Anybody here sew, make doll clothes, or make your own clothes, or make 
pillows or quilts. Good. That's wonderful. Okay. So this next phase of my observational research tells me what? We are all good at different things, right? We're all good at different things. Okay, so back to the end of the school year. If you go to school, there is one day at the end of the school year that some kids just can't wait for and other kids don't want to participate in. Do you know what that day is? What? What did we do at kayak one? Track and field. Track and field day. Who likes it? If you're in school, do you like track and field day? That's when we race against each other, right? You like to run races? You like to be in competitions? Well, there are some kids that don't like to be at track and field day because maybe they're not so good. You haven't? I bet you'll have one before school gets out. You have a field day coming up? Yep. Okay, have a seat. Okay, so this past Thursday, have a seat. Sit down, sit down, okay. This past Thursday, I got to go to Cypress Adventist School's field day. And my son, who goes to Cypress Adventist School, at first didn't want to go because he's not the fastest runner in his class. But I have to say, and parents, this is a big plug, okay? I've been to a couple different field days at a couple of different schools. I love Cypress's field day because they do so many silly things in their relay races. They did, um, they had a, they, they rode a pool noodle, a pool noodle dressed up as a cowboy. That was one of the relays. They had to carry a rubber chicken with chopsticks. And that was one of the relays. So they do a lot of fun things and they make sure that everybody gets a chance to excel. So, how many of you have ever gotten one of these for something? Do you know what these are? Ribbons. Do you know what the colors mean? Do you know what red means? Second place. White? Third place. What is first place color? Blue. There's another color, green. What is green usually for? Does anybody know? Participating. Usually green means you got a ribbon for participating. Okay, what is this? A certificate or an award. So after I went to the field day and had a lot of fun with the kids out at Kayak Point, yesterday I went to the awards chapel at Cypress School. Now, my son, again, was not excited about field day, and he didn't want to go because he didn't think he'd get any ribbons. And I was so shocked because my son, yesterday at awards day, they kept calling his name. And he got this one for the relay races, and he got another one for the 40-yard dash, and he got another one for the marathon, and he got another one for softball throw. Wow. Excellent. And this one is special. This is signed by Barack Obama. See that signature there? That is the man. That is the signature of the man himself. This is the President's National Physical Fitness Award, and another shameless plug for Cyprus. Many, many students at Cyprus School achieved the National Fitness Award and the higher one, which is the President's Fitness Award, at least, was it eight? I don't know where Lowell is, but this is, we're talking 50 kids at the school, and many of them worked on this all year long. Okay, so I wanna show you another award. Who has a trophy at home? Who has a trophy? What is your trophy for? What did you get your trophy for? Soccer. Excellent. Megan. Academic excellence. Excellent. Top grades in her class. What was yours for? Your, a trophy. Did you get one like this? What, is, what was it for? Soccer. Soccer. Baseball. Another recruit right there, Campbell. What's yours? Did you get one? Cutest smile. <laughs> you got a prize? Excellent. So when I was in school, and you might relate to this, if you're not one of the kids that usually gets trophies for soccer or baseball, I was always picked last. 
Isn't that a bummer? I didn't look like this when I was in school. I was very small. I was much smaller than the other kids in my class. I ran the slowest. I kicked the shortest. I was always picked last. Anybody here picked last? You might not want to raise your hand because you might be embarrassed about that, but you shouldn't be. Because when I got to high school, I played soccer and I got a trophy. I got a trophy for soccer. And my trophy says, Fletcher Academy, soccer, most sportsmanlike player, 1984. Eek. Angie Holdsworth, that was my name. So I like that the best. Do you know what most sportsmanlike player is? Anybody heard that before? Has anybody seen that trophy? What is it, Campbell? Well, it means you have great sportsmanship, absolutely. What is sportsmanship? Um, being nice? That is right. It's being nice, right? Being a good teammate, being a good team player. Okay, so I drew this out really long because I think this is really important. We're all different. Nobody's the same. Everybody has different talents. Do you know what my talent is? It's not singing. I sound terrible. It's not running. It's, it's telling stories. That's my talent. And I love it. I love telling stories to kids. And that's the talent God gave me. So this year, when you go to your field day, or when you have a running race, or when you're picked last on the games, remember, everybody's different. God all gave us all something special. And we can earn awards and ribbons and trophies for being nice. At Cypress School, they have a trophy that everybody in the classroom votes on the nicest kid, and you get to take home a trophy. So another shameless plug for Cypress School. I hope you parents will consider Adventist education because it's really an inspiring place to be. And I hope you all have a wonderful summer, having fun, doing your best. Oh, sportsmanship is always do, is doing your best also. And being happy and having fun. Thank you.
heaven, we thank you that you have brought each and every person here today. We understand that life is a gift. We understand that life is not to be taken for granted. Thank you for a community of believers who profess the name of Jesus and who have as their aim the betterment of this world, who have as their aim the relieving of pain, of poverty, who have as their aim the binding up of the broken. God, we give our aims to you. We know that many times we fall short and we ask that you will make amends on our behalf. Father, we pray that this church will continue to be a light set on a hill, a community of people that are known for their love and for the difference that they make. God, at this time, we want to celebrate those who are coming to the end of a school. We know there are some that are graduating from middle school, from high school, from college. And we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for giving them wisdom to excel. We thank you for giving them the strength to be able to go to classes and to do their best. And as they look forward to beginning life in the workforce or going to the next stage of education, we pray your guidance, we pray success for their life. Lord, even as we celebrate those who have graduated, we know that in this world which has the capacity for so much good, there is also the capacity for so much sorrow. Even now we remember the students at Seattle Pacific who are recovering and mourning the death of one of their own. God, we ask that you will be near to the family who have lost a child. We pray that you will be with the families that have children at Harborview that are struggling and that are fighting for their life. We pray healing upon them. Father, we also remember Charles Bertoff. We remember Corey. We remember Scott. These gentlemen are also fighting for healing and for recovery. And we claim your promise to be the great physician, the balm in Gilead. And we pray that you will soothe their wounded souls. Father God, we know that when we come as a community, that there is healing to be found in conversation, in song, and in the reading of the word. And we pray that you will use those elements to minister to each person today. I don't believe that it was happenstance that anyone decided to choose Green Lake this morning. And so we pray your spirit to be with John. We ask that the words that will leave his mouth, you will energize them and you will make them words in due season to refresh our souls. We also remember Cyprus at this time as they look for a new tenant. We pray that you will bring the right tenant for them and that you will continue to bless that educational institution that shapes and forms and challenges children to be adults that will make a difference in this world. Bless us, fill us with your spirit as we continue in worship. In Jesus' name. Amen.
The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abitharite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hands of the Midian. The Lord returned to him and said, Go in strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Gideon replied, if now, I have found, if now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. The Lord said, I will await your return. Gideon went inside, prepared a young goat, and made bread without yeast. Putting the meat in a basket and the broth in a pot, he brought them out and offered to him, them to him under the oak. The angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of his staff in his hand. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid. You are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace.
An angel of the Lord appeared to the priest Zechariah. The angel stood at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. God sent the angel Gabriel to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel said to her, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of a greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Vacations are wonderful things, but they come to an end. And some of you have been asking, what did I bring back? So I spent a month in the desert. It was rich. It was sweet. And the the most important thing I bring back is memories of dawn. It is my habit to not let dawn go unobserved, even here in Washington even when the sun is not shining. But when you're in the desert, how could one let the sun rise without watching? So we were camped on the north rim of Grand Canyon. My wife, Carm, a couple of friends. Beautiful campground. Our campsite looked east over a a lush meadow, trees way over there, so a, a big sky. So we'd gone to bed, we knew it was going to be cool, it was cold. The only problem with this campground is the elevation, it's at 8,000 feet, and they were having a cold snap, so in the morning when I checked my little thermometer, which I always carry, so that if I complain about being cold, I can look and see if I have a good excuse, I had a good excuse. When I crawled out of my sleeping bag at about 4.30, I checked my thermometer, 22 degrees. So I pulled on the insulated ski pants and my down coat and then the chore coat over all the other layers I had on and put on my hat and gloves. Fired up the jet boil, it's an amazing stove just in a minute or two, you have something hot. So I take my thermos of heat and my two cookies and my chair, and I walked a little ways away from camp to where I had a perfect view looking east, and I parked in my chair to savor the smile of dawn. When I sat down, still a few stars. Um, Lyra, and the, no, Vega and the constellation of Lyra was about dead overhead. Constellation Cygnus, these are two of my favorite summer constellations. They were up there, but, but they were fading fast. So I sat, and I sat, and took a little heat in, and watched the sky brighten. It was glorious. Absolutely glorious. Finally, you know, 
the horizon is almost so bright I can't look at it. And then the first, the first beams as the sun is above the horizon. Time to stir around for me. Time to start getting breakfast. And magically, just a little while later, these people who were wrapped in their sleeping bags, hiding in their tents, I could hear stirring. The sun was waking them up even though they were inside. And finally they came out and started the day. It was a gorgeous day. Jesus uses the rising sun as a picture of the character of God. Just as the sun comes even for those who do not watch for it, those who are completely oblivious to it, it still rises and it still warms their world. Jesus has insisted that God's favor comes to those who look for it, certainly, and even to those who don't. And he challenged us to live like children of the Heavenly Father whose favor is so indiscriminate. It's a great challenge. Now, when you think of, of dawn and the way I've pictured it, you know, what a, what a welcoming, soothing, heartwarming picture of, of the universe. And you know, there, the Grand Canyon area, nature is so benign. Now, in the summer, the heat can get you, I'll admit that. But when we, we originally were planning to go backpacking into the wilds of that country, and so you have to protect your food from the dangerous animals that are there. And I say dangerous, I put it in quotes, you'll smile. Those of you who have hiked in North Cascades, you understand when you protect food, you know, it's just... It's this carbon fiber plastic thing, you're bomb proof because bears. In Grand Canyon, you have a little steel mesh bag to keep the mice out. That's all. It's a pretty safe world out there. However, earlier, before we got to Grand Canyon, I was visiting some friends in Montana. And we were going to go hiking in Glacier National Park. Wonderful. And as we leave the house and we're headed toward Glacier National Park, one of the women throws a fit. She is not about to go on this hike unless we stop and get a can of bear spray. She was a local. She always carried bear spray. And we didn't have it. She was not going without it, so I'm laughing at her. I'm going, you know, it is far more likely we're going to encounter unfriendly people than it is bears. I've never, I've never come across a bear hiking. I mean, in fact, all I have to do is announce I'm going for a hike. All the interesting animals disappear. No, I've got to get bears. Okay, all right, okay. So we stopped, we bought a can of spare bear spray, headed on up. Parked the car at the trailhead, loaded up our packs, made sure the bear spray was not inside the pack. Headed up the trail. Bears, yeah, right. I mean, I know this is Glacier National Park and grizzlies exist there, but I mean, that's theoretical. I've never seen them. Half a mile in, we come to patches of snow and you know what? In those patches of snow, there were these humongous footprints with long, I'm only exaggerating slightly, long claw marks at the end of those footprints. Them's bears, all right. But uh, they're old tracks, I'm sure. They are old, right? <laughs> So we kept hiking. We hiked slower and slower. Eventually, the bear spray lady said, this is not fun anymore. Let's go back. 
So we turned around and headed back to the car because the presence of the tracks, in spite of the can of bear spray, reminded her of a story she knew. She was a local. And grizzly bears are a problem. And they do bad things, at least on occasion. And uh, she was no longer enthralled with the beauty of nature. She was concerned about the danger of nature. Which picture of the universe is correct? Is it this place that is blessed with the dawning sun? Is it a place haunted by frightful bears? Well, the world we live in is, of course, both. And we were reminded of that Thursday with a shooting at SPU. You know, first thing I did, you know, called Pastor Andreas. How many people do we have connected with the school? Can you find them? And he got busy finding them. It's a scary world. And that's our world. The sun does rise. Seattle in the springtime is gorgeous and beautiful. And there are dark and scary things here. Both are true. It seems to me that the primary job of the Christian faith, the reason we come to worship is to receive more deeply into ourselves that one aspect of the universe tells us more about God than the other. Typically, religion is just like life. It's this mix of the wonderful and the scary. And a bunch of you grew up with that. God is love. And boy, you're going to be fried You get whiplash. Actually, you don't because the God is love thing tends to shrink and pale in, in its power to touch us. And we tend to get impressed mostly by the t- terror. You know, my friend, as we're out there hiking, we were surrounded by gorgeous stuff. But all she could all she could give attention to were those tracks of a potentially deadly carnivore. I don't even know if it was a grizzly bear, but in Glacier National Park, being novices, that's what we assume. But when we come to church, our job here is to join with Scripture in our insistence that it is the dawn that tells us most about God, not the bears. If you go through the Bible stories about encounters between some kind of divine personage and human beings, sometimes it's God who appears, sometimes it's an angel, it's, but if a divine person, a divine visitor shows up and has an encounter with a human, in the Bible, there is one phrase that jumps out of those encounters way more than anything else. And you heard it in our scripture. The people immediately assume it's a grizzly bear. Now, with a grizzly bear, it may just be, hey, good morning. <laughs> or it may be lunch. The problem is you don't know which. Which? And so when humans encounter this divine presence, this divine appearance, their reaction is, "Uh uh-oh, this is a grizzly bear. What's going to happen? And God, knowing our, our reaction over and over again in Scripture says, don't be afraid. Don't Don't worry. I am not going to eat you. How is it with your religion? 
Does your religion paint God the grizzly bear or God the sun that rises with healing in his wings? My invitation and our invitation to one another is to learn to see God as the dawn because that is the truth. Let's pray. 
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.